Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Aidan Hiedigan, um, and I'm just going to, I'm doing a follow up to Marshall's presentation from two weeks ago, uh, highlighting some of uh, PyU's new features and um, also showing, going through some of the Access OM2 configs and, well, showing you how to, how to grab one and run it. Um, if, if Paul Spence isn't, it doesn't come, then he's going to have to watch the video because I'm not going to explain it to him a second time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just to recap, hang on. You can hit the face below. This is not the latest version, excuse me. Just a moment. Try that again. Yes, there we go, outline. Right, so we'll just do a recap of, um, of PayU, um, just quickly what PayU is, then we'll go on to some new PayU features, uh, some upcoming ones that I want to whet your appetite with and maybe get some um, some feedback uh, from people. And then just, as I say, just a quick uh, how to get an Access OM2 model and um, how to run it. So uh, if you were here last, last time or you this, we watched the video from last time, then then you'll know it. Payu is a Python-based scientific workflow manager written by Marshall. Um, ha, what does that mean? Well, it means that it runs your model for you. So it does a, it's pretty simple in, it, in its basic idea. It just sets up a ru model run directory. So it's, it's always called work. It runs the model in there. It moves any outputs and any restarts to an archive directory. Uh, it cleans up your run directory, the work directory, and then uh, if it needs to, it will run again. So you can instruct PyU to run multiple times, and that's basically it. That, that's pretty much all it does. But um, there's often the devil is in the detail. Um, so the new features we'll go over today. Uh, the, one of the m most important maybe is this fast mom collation. Um, so um, mom typically tiles its outputs and restarts and then needs to collate at least the outputs um, so that you can view them and, and uh, analyze them. And sometimes uh, you need to collate restarts as well, typically if you change your layout of your model, uh, but also people like Ryan uh, collate restarts all the time because they're interested in the, in the numbers that are in there. Initial state. And for initial states, yes. And if it was, yeah, so if you want to start from an, from an, someone else's run, you want you can collate their yeah, restarts and use that as an initial state. So, um, but uh, this collation step has become a bottleneck, bottleneck particularly in the tenth degree high, high resolution models. It's not a problem at one degree, less of a quarter degree starting to get slow. But the, the high resolution models, it's really slow. It can take hours to collate. It can take longer to collate the output than run the model. Um, so, um, thank, well, there's a, there's a new MPP and C combine in town. So this is the name of the uh, program that is used to to stitch those tiles back together, uh, and it's and it's fast. How fast? Well, probably not faster than the Waco kit. Oh come on, you can show it. That's an animation. <laughs> anyway, that's a Blazing Saddles reference. Um, uh, but it's very fast, so it's so it's called MPP and C combined <laughs> dash fast. Yes. Um, so it was written by Scott Wales, who would normally be in this video chat, but he's been locked out of the video conference room. Um, it it collates any tiled FMS out, model output. So um, FMS stands for Flexible Modeling System. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's written by GFDL. So any of the GFDL models use this in behind and so they're all using the same the same uh, back end so mom5 mom6 and the old gold model um, are examples so uh, it was written it was written to uh, particularly to be fast at collating uh, net city for compressed data so as I was saying before the tenth model output is getting very very slow to collate but it's also very large and so we definitely want to have uh, compressed net city for data files. But um, when you want to collate all these tiles, you first have to, in the old method, uncompress, 
uh, and then put them in the new file and then compress it again. And that's a slow step. So, um, so Scott wrote MPP and C combined fast so that it, what it does is it directly copies each of the, the compressed chunks from all the tiles into the new, new data and does no uncompression or recompression. So um, the requirements to use MPP and C combined fast, well, you need an MPP and C combined fast uh, executable. So there's one in short public APH 502. I actually haven't checked the permissions on that, damn it. Sorry, they probably, you probably can't read it. I'll have to do that afterwards. Um, and then you either copy that to the to the place where your model expects to find it, which is typically in short project model name and bin, or you can just specify the full path in your config.yaml. You'll also need the latest version of Payu, Payu, Payu on, uh, on Ragin, which is 0 0.10. So module load Payu slash 0 0.10 and those are the two things you'll need to be able to use this, as well as an updated config.yaml. So the old syntax in the config.yaml look like that. So uh, the first one, collate, just says, yes, I want to collate my files, but then there are a bunch of sub options, collate underscore mem, underscore q, underscore ncus, and underscore flags. Um, that, that, apart from being ugly, um, it's also not very, very, uh, uh, extensible, you know, like it, anyway, it's horrible. So the new syntax, which we've been meaning to do for a while, now uses replaces all those collate underscore options with a dictionary. So there's now a collate dictionary. So if you want to turn collation on or off, you use the enable flag. That um, defaults to true, so you don't really need it if you want to. It want to, but you need to put false if you don't want to collate for some reason. Um, you can you specify the queue, the memory as before, wall time. But there are some new flags that you need to use if you want to use MPPNC combined fast. First one is MPI and true. So uh, in order to support, still support the old models, we needed to have some way of, of knowing whether we were running MPPNC combined fast. This is an MPI program. It needs to run in a different way to the old program, which was just a single a single CPU. So it needs to basically put an MPI run on the, fast, on the front of it. So, the flag to do that is MPI true. At some point, that might become uh, the default once everyone uses this. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, yeah, that's what you have to do. You also have to su you should supply the number of CPUs you want to use. You can also supply supply number of threads. So the old MPC, PPN, even PPNC combine, we sort of sped that up by using threads and doing multiple collations uh, at a time. It, it was vaguely successful. This can still do the same thing. It's not necessary, not really necessary, probably, but it still has that option. So in this case, you're asking for four CPUs. You'll be using two threads, so two CPUs per thread. Um, as I said, MPP and C combined fast leads at, at least two CPUs to run. It will not run with one. Uh, it should give you an error. Um, so the other two, the other things that I've uh, uh, just commented out in this example is this is how you can you can specify the path to your executable if you need to. So if you just want to give it the full path, so the one that I, the example one I gave. Um, flags have changed. So it used to be sometimes people would supply their own flags. You never really needed to, but if you needed, to, if you wanted to change some behavior, um, and those flags are not the same as they used to be. So don't, don't try and use the same flags you used to. It doesn't support most of them anymore. It doesn't need to really. Um, you don't need to because the defaults are sensible. Yeah, I mean, some of the flags we had, we had, we had to that were defaulted to before were things like NetCDF four output because that wasn't the default in the program. Oh, has that changed? Well, this always spits out NetCDF four. It has this to. This particular it's version does. MPP and C combined fast always support. Right. Always okay. puts out. There's just no point in using it if you're not going to have collated um, compressed outputs. Because we do provide default flags when they're not given. That's right. There are default flags which work perfectly well. Okay. What I'm saying is, if you try and set those flags, you don't need to set the flags. But if, if for some reason you do, because you know what you're doing, don't use the same flags you used to. They don't, they're not supported anymore. Um, and uh, this was a little bit of, of sugar for Ryan, who isn't here. But um, a future in future will be will support collating restarts automatically. And so that's the flag you would use. But that currently doesn't do anything. But if you wanted to collate your restarts, you'd put restart true, and it'll collate those as well. Um, Right, so resource requirements. 
Um, in general, the memory uh, for this is independent of resolution, which the old MPPNC command is not in spades. I mean, it uses huge amounts of memory for large, uh, large sort of tenth degree outputs, for example. So in general, it's independent of resolution and you can easily get away with less than four gigabytes per thread. I mean, sometimes less than a gig. Um, it should take minutes to run. Um, so I'm just giving you an idea of what you might need to set your config.yaml. Uh, hey, hey, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I think I understand this. Can you explain a thread for me? So, is it, so if you have two CPUs per thread, right, is that essentially running as a separate job? So it would just, for example, do one particular restart file collation? Yeah, that's right. So the number of threads, if you've only got one thing to collate, there's no point in having two threads. If you've only got so, one file to collate, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's just no point. Right. If you've got, yeah, so that's that's basically what it's just each each one of those threads is an MPI run of M, of MPPNC combined fast. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, yep. And the restart yeah. stuff that like you're talking about with Ryan because it saves a lot of disk space. Um, are we going to make that mandatory going forward for like for example the mom models or no? We might choose to to default to true. Um, I. I, I I think um, collated restarts, particularly compressed collated restarts, are going to ex increase in initialization time. Yeah, but we're not. The thing is, we're not going to collate them before the next model iteration. We're only going to collate them when we clean up restarts. So. Um, I see. I see. Yeah. So, so you won't do well. Potentially, okay. yes. Okay. I mean, and 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 in, and anyway, you can turn it on if you want, if it suits you. But yeah, I think potentially it might might. Turn out to be true, just like some other options. We've just started. We've just defaulted to true after a while once people get used to it. So, and like every fifth restart, someone is wiping off all the, the all, you know, that's every right. fifth restart action, it would do it then. That's, that's right. That's more reasonable. Yeah, and that, and that's a good time to do it because uh, you know if if you need to go back to a previous you know a previous restart, often it's only the last few ones you want to do it with. Maybe something crashes, yeah, yeah. And, you, um, and even then, yeah, it's not a big deal. So. Um, yeah, so that that's what we, we I do envisage that that will probably end up being true, but that is not supported yet. So um, it's just it was just there to, as an example of what it will, what you will have to do to collect your restarts. Yeah. It's virtually not a teaser. That's right. Okay, so we're up to resource requirements. Very little memory, wall time in minutes, and I'm talking seriously minutes. Um, even the tenth, you, you'd have to check. It depends how many things you're going to collate and how many CPUs you throw at it. But I'd be surprised if it took longer than 20 minutes. I think you did 100 gigabytes in two two minutes. Yeah, but it depends. Right? It depends how many. Uh, yeah, it depends how many files you've got though as well, and and how you choose to how many CPUs you choose to use. Yeah, but I mean, 100 gigabytes in two minutes is a pretty good metric. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, pretty yeah. good ballpark. Was it that much? Yeah. Um, that's I'm going on pretty bad yeah. memory, here, but that's what I remember. Right. So um, you will see no speed up for low resolution models in the one degree global model, for example, um, simply because the MPI ha has some uh, overhead to get started. And so there's, there's probably no point unless there's something in particular, some other reason you want to use it. But um, for quarter degree and tenth degree, it, it's a lot faster. It's 30 gigs in two minutes. 30 gigs in two minutes. There. So there you go. Um, I did a test and, and, and told Marshall about it, and we collated, uh, collated 30 gigs of 10th model output in two minutes. So that gives you an idea, uh, a rough idea, however much output you've got. If, you, if you've got 100 gig, it'll probably take you know, six minutes. So, um, and a minimum of two CPUs, again, reiterate that. So uh, this is sort of subtle. Um, your layout affects your efficiency. Don't go, don't go, Spence. This is important. <laughs> your chunk size is automatically chosen by NetCDF and, and it depends on the tile size. This is specifically for him. Anyway, so inconsistent tile sizes means inconsistent chunk sizes. Okay, so inconsistent chunk sizes makes the program slow. It has to uncompress and then recompress again because it needs. It basically it chooses the chunk size based on the first one it comes across, and if there are different ones, it has to do this uncompress, recompress step. So it's slow. Um, so you need to make your processor layout an integer divisor of your grid, and make your I/O layout an integer divisor of your layout. What do I mean by that? So here's an example. 
And this is the example I wanted to show Spence, but he's gone. So the quarter degree Momsys model, which he has been running a great deal, is over the years, is is has a 1440 by 1080 grid. So yeah, sorry, I'll just recap, Paul. Um, you've got to make for this to be fast, you've got to make your um, your layout um, divide evenly into your grid and your I/O layout. So as I said, this quarter degree Momsys. Uh, model, this 1440 by 1080, um, typically used a layout of 6430, so dividing 1440 into 60 by into 64 bits, 64 chunks, tiles, uh, and um, and 1080 by 30. And then another typical v uh, number for the I/O layout, so you didn't didn't have bazillions of files, was was eight six, eight by six. So uh, that so 64 by 30 is 1920 CPUs. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't 64 doesn't go into 1440 in an integer way, um, and so your tile sizes end up being um, either 22 by 36 or 23 by 36. It just divides it up into these two different tile sizes. So then, even though your I/O tiles, um, in theory, your I/O layout would divide that evenly, it doesn't end up doing that, um, which is what I found out when I was trying to help Ryan um, make this go faster. Um, you get you get IO tiles of 184 by 180 and 176 by 180. So again, they're just four off either way. Um, so this is slow for collecting normal data and un and your untiled data. So let's uh, not restart. So the re regional outputs, for example, are, are not tiled. Um, so anyway, it, it's slow it, because because it has to do this uncompression uncompression and recompression step for some portion of the data. So how Sorry, do you can you can I ask some questions on that? Sure. Just because I'm an idiot. Do you want to see um, the, how it's done properly and then ask the question? Well, can you tell me the difference between layout and I/O layout? Layout is basically what one times the other is the number of CPUs. So that's yeah, the number so that's of, the number of tiles, and that's usually the number of like collated files you have too, isn't it? It is, unless you specify I/O layout, and it's as different. It's disastrous, All right. All right. Disastrously yeah. bad to not not specify I/O layout on a large model like that. You just, if you remember, that's when you end up using huge amounts of space and um, and file and inodes and it's not it's not faster, uh, it's not better. So um, it's, it's always good to use. So an IO layout uh, is literally the same thing, just dividing 1440 by 8 and 1080 by 6 and that's the size of your tiles. So 180 specifically combines ranks into a single macro domain. MPI guy here. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, but no one cares about that. <laughs> no, 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 I mean it takes a bunch of you know the sixty four thirty yeah. divides it into how many tiles one hundred nineteen twenty tiles. Yeah, file domain gathers some of those together into larger macro yeah, tiles for input and output. Yeah. Um, right. So, so the I/O layout should be way bigger than the layout. In general, the yeah. File, the the the, don't, the the tile size will be much bigger. Yeah. There'll be fewer. Yeah, yeah. The, num yeah. the numbers yeah. are smaller because yeah. you divide yeah. them. You, you basically your tiles get bigger. So yeah. uh, Thanks. An, an improved layout for for that quarter degree model would be 60, 60 de comma thirty six. So sixty and x thirty six and y. So are you saying the other one would not work with MPP combined fast? It works. It's just slow. I see. So you get no benefit from. You get some benefit. It's it's still MPP and C combined because it's written in a better way uses way less memory regardless of what you do. Okay. So it's still better. Right. It's, it's it has a lower memory footprint. But way lower. It, is it faster? It's still going to be faster because you're still going to be able, some of those that you're going to be able just to copy straight away. But, I see. But some of them you'll have to uncompress. But it's not really it. utilizing it. No. I see. No. And you're you. not getting the best bang for your buck. And you said, yeah. Anyway, so how can you change it? Well, you can use a different layout. So 6036 um, is a 21, 2160 CPU layout. So it's pretty close, 90 to 1920. You could you could find some other numbers, but anyway. Um, so in this case, it divides evenly. Tiles are 24 by 10 every, <coughs> everywhere. And in this case, the IO tiles are 144 by by 180 everywhere. Have I got that right? Yes. I mean, the idea is sound. Even if the numbers are. Yeah, I might have stuff at the ITO. Anyway, the point is that divides evenly into. It's not hard to do. 
and it and it and you'll get and you'll get a lot faster collation. So and you can you can uh, change your existing layouts to this pretty simply. Just change your layout and collate your restarts, and you're pretty much good to go. Now your mask, you have to change your mask, mask tables and stuff. Anyway, if you want to do that, get hold of me. I, I made an out, I made a configuration for Ryan that does this. Anyway, so that's fast for collating all the tiled and untiled output. If you know, it, that's the way to go. So I guess are there any other questions about that? It does sacrifice one of the best features of MOM, which is the ability to deal with non-uniform grids. So it, it does put us in a tricky place with performance. But that's, I mean, I think that's obvious from what you said. I'm just kind of pointing it out. Yeah, I mean, it, it just requires, it, all it's doing is putting one small constraint on how you how you choose these numbers. I mean, it seems many. like a small constraint when the numbers are quite large. But as your tiles get smaller and smaller, I can tell you, you just bite the bullet. You know, at some point, you're going to get a factor of seven or five in there that you just can't split anymore. Right. And you just start getting uneven tiles. And... Well, it's, a, it's a anyway, I, I, I think I'm it's working. just a reality, but it's just something to, to keep in mind. Yeah, well, it's, it's totally up to each person yeah. who decides what trade offs they want. Yeah. If you've got a lot of IO and a lot of collation, then you'll probably choose to do it this way. Right. Okay. Sorry, someone's like, hey. a question? Yeah, it's Scott here. Hi, Scott. Um, so what's important is the netcdf chunks within the file. So as long as those netcdf chunks are the same in each file, um, it will it will do the fast copy on everything except for the edges of the array where they don't exactly line up. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, it, it is, is possible to get the fast copying if you don't have the integer multiples. It's just trickier. Yeah, so this, I don't know if you saw this slide, but this is the, this is why, um, the, the logic behind that. Now, the first step, chunk sizes chosen automatically by NetCDF and depend on tile size, is the one you would have to change if you wanted to, if you didn't want this to happen. So you, we could programmatically decide to have consistent chunk, chunk sizes across our tiles, regardless of the size of the tiles. But we haven't done that. So unless we do that, you have, you have to do what I'm saying. So, but it's possible. Sure, it's possible, and it's probably once you, once you hit the problem that you're you're intimating, that's a good idea to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but currently, we don't do that. Okay. Most people will never care because most people will rely on pre-configured runs anyway. Yeah. So. Um, but it, I'm just saying there are lots of existing quarter degree 1440 by 1080 with a 1920 CPU layout, like bazillions yeah. of them. Yeah, because that was quite standard for us. For Very standard. Yeah, and it's a, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But it just doesn't work nicely with mm -hmm. this. Right. Okay, this isn't a particularly new feature. Uh, this was from earlier in the year, I think, was it? Um, but a lot of people don't know about it necessarily, so I thought I'd, I'd chuck it in there as well. So runs per submit. So for a low CPU count uh, model, you can have a wall time of up to 48 hours on, on the region. Um, there's a command called nf underscore limits to find out uh, what your Q limits are. So I wrote it down in my notes, but I can't see them anymore because I'm an idiot. Uh, but I think it's up to 256, you can get 48 hours, and then up to 512, I think it's 24 hours, and then up to 1,023, well, less than 1,024, it's 10 hours. Um, so um, Marshall said the exact opposite of this in the, in the last part, you think, but I think you may want to maximize wall time to reduce the effect of queuing time. Oh, no, I, I was saying it from a... From a community perspective. Right, oh, stuff the community. So yeah. the, the machine can most efficiently schedule jobs if they're small and maneuverable. If they're big and unmovable, then it's much harder to get more jobs on. Right. Unfortunately, the machine also is very good at scheduling people who can submit uh, 500 jobs at a time, which we can't because we're running serial jobs. They're literally take doing exactly that. <laughs> Well, it's just there's more of them than you. Yes, yeah, right. So, <laughs> so they can they can they can maximise their slots in the queue, and whenever you just resubmit your single serial job, it just goes behind their jobs unless it's got a higher priority. So for people running um, these sorts of models, you really want to run for as long as possible in the queue, uh, because your amount of amount of queuing time re reduces as a proportion of your total total time, and your thro your your throughput will increase. Um, Subject to them changing the queuing algorithm and not telling us and finding out that it doesn't. But I'd like to know if this, that isn't the case. But that that has been 
that's been shown to work so far. So you want to maximize your wall time uh, to reduce the effective queuing time. Um, but if you want to, to run your model for us for 48 hours, uh, it's maybe a bit dumb because uh, if it crashes, you lose all of that time. And uh, also, particularly, you know, you, all your upwards are going to end up in one directory, for example, the way um, MOM works. Um, so that's not necessarily a good thing either. You know, you, you might want to run at it for a year at a time or, or whatever. Um, so runs per sub just allows you to do that, gives you a bit more flexibility. So this will, what this does is it runs your model, runs per sub time for every PBS submit. So you do, you do a pay you run, if your run sub submit, runs per sub is 23, it will run the model, it'll do all the things it normally does, a setup, run the model, clean up, and then where it would normally exit, it just runs the model again, and again, and again, until it hits 23 or until you, you've exhausted the total number of uh, runs you want it to do. And so um, some things to note though, wall time must allow for the number of the runs per sub. So it doesn't calculate it for you. If your wall time uh, is normally, for example, uh, two, um, then you can't say wall time two, it won't run 23 submissions. You've got to multiply it by however many year runs per sub is. You can argue that 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 it should do that automatically. I'm not convinced because um, it doesn't know what your wall time limits are. And stuff. So you have to take care of making the wall time appropriate. That's all. Um, and if the and if your actual model runtime exceeds your wall time, um, or you'll just lose your last pay you run. Um, it'll just crash, uh, but and pay you will not resubmit if it was if it was a, if it would have ha would have done otherwise. So you're not losing too much. You can definitely have a little play. Marshall. Do we, does each run occur in its own output and NN directory? Yes. So if you do this, you'll if you run submit this once, you'll have 23 output directories. Yes, 23 output directories. 23 restarts. Obviously, some will be cleaned up, but it, it's like you've run it 23 times from. The, but it just means you don't have to queue as often. So there's environment. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Um, so uh, as an example. So resubmission pay, you can resubmit itself with the minus n command line option. So you can run your model n times. Uh, some models will use dates to determine how long you want to run, but pay you just uses an, uh, an integer number. So the example I gave before, if I wanted to do 50 runs of the model, I would say pay you run minus n 50. Um, so in the next two things show you the example. So if runs per sub is one, which is the default. So unless you set it, it's set to one, even if it doesn't appear in the config.yaml. In that example, you would get 50 PBS submissions and a single run in each. If you had runs per sub 23, which was an example before, that would that would run three PBS submissions. 23 runs of the model in the first one, 23 in the next one, and four in the in the subsequent run. To, to 50. Um, thank you, person who wrote this program. Um, right there. Yeah. But anyway, so. Um, uh, so you can see you can see why perhaps why I chose 23. If I say it takes 24 two hours to run and I chose 24, it's a bit close. It might go over the 48 hours. So I, this is just an example of how you would want to make sure that you have a little bit of buffer time. But if you know that it's consistent, just a bit below two hours, you could easily do 24. It's you just have to try and see what happens. Pretty much. It also depends on the, how much your model varies in its runtime. Usually they're not too much, but it's up to you. Um, so this can this is a really good tool for people who have cheap models and want to run them a lot, basically. And I try and encourage people to do that. I don't think it would be hard to catch the final crashed run and clean it up and resubmit it into the next one. Sure. One Value the, issues feature. Yeah. Has, yeah. I mean, we can track um, return codes as the run goes. Look, look, there's pretty, lots of things we could yeah. do, I guess. Because um, yeah, we're uh, talking about a heartbeat thing as well, which is, you know. Look, when I when I when I coded this up for someone else who's using Bash scripts, a similar sort of thing. What I in that case, what I did was to to tell, get them to tell me how long the ra the model ran ran for, and just calculate whether I had enough time left in the run. And so you could do something like that as well. But run times change. Run times change. You know, whatever. This this works pretty well. Um, it's pretty well tested. I certainly have. So any any PayU model will work with this. It doesn't matter what model you run. MIT GCM. Uh, all of them. That's that's the advantage of using something like PayU. Once you have a feature for one of them, you've got a feature for all of them, pretty much. I should say the MPP NC combined fast is is only an FMS, a MOM 
style enhancement. The other models sort of don't need it, but um, anyway. So upcoming features. Oh, down. Here we go. File tracking. So we've wanted to do this for a long, 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 long time. A long time. How long? Really long. Um, uh, so, uh, Andy, so I should say um, uh, the motivation for doing this uh, was happened in like the first couple of weeks of I started working here, which shamefully is four years ago, um, when uh, I remember uh, Paul Spence being at a mom meeting and saying that there was a bad aerosol file that had crept into some runs that they knew was bad, but for some reason had still remained in the input directory. And how do we know which runs we're using this file? You know, which ones can we need to redo? And it was sort of pretty much impossible to find out. And I thought, we really need to track the files that go on, go in, the files that we're using in each run. Four years later, it still hasn't happened, but it's getting there. Um, so um, the key advantages of file tracking, well, we can, we can track all their input files that are used for each of the model runs, as I said. Um, uh, we can reproducibly, reproducibly rerun a previous experiment. So uh, if we want to go back to a previous uh, run number or whatever and say, I want to run this, uh, and I want to make sure that I'm using all the same files I was using last time. There's pretty much no way of, of, of us doing that at the moment. We just don't know. We can have a guess. Oh, I think this hasn't changed. We can look at file that it, It's supremely uh, not okay. <laughs> it just doesn't... It, it's not really. We, the only way to do it is something like this. So we, with this, we'd be able to reproducibly rerun a previous experiment. We can share experiments very easily because all the input files that go into an experiment are, are defined in these manifest files, which I'm, I'm going to come to. Um, so as long as people have, have access to those files on the file system, they can run. Even if they don't have access, we can... Um, skip to the last feature, we can potentially have databases of, of files. We can keep a track of all the files that have ever been used and we can find them on the on the uh, file system. We could even, you know, there's just, there's no limit to what you can do, but you, you can even have a, a sort of data vault to make sure that you always keep at least one copy of every file that's ever been used. There, there's just so many things you could do with this uh, sort of approach um, so that even if you wanted to share experiment and those files weren't there anymore, but you had a database, you know where to find them, then um, you can have a tool that would just change the paths to where they are or whatever, put them somewhere, no problem. Um, so it's all, it opens up a lot of possibilities. And also a small thing, but it gives you the flexibility with specifying, specifying your path to input files. So currently the PayU model is that you have input directories and PayU just goes to the input directory and makes a symbolic link for every file that's in that input directory into an appropriate place in your work directory. That's how it works. Um, uh, in some cases, it's useful to not have the, exactly the same file name in your source, but you want it to have a different file, the standard file name where, where you're running the model. So you could do that with this. You can change, you could change the name. You can map any arbitrary name to any other arbitrary name in the work directory. It's a small thing, but it could be, could be quite useful, I think. Um, particularly for you know, power users who want to set up a configuration for other people. So what is tracked? Uh, currently, we're tracking, we have three different uh, uh, groups of files tracked, executables, inputs, and restarts. So they're all, uh, they're grouped for that reason, because executables we expect not to change very often. Uh, Inputs we expect also not to change very often, um, and, but restarts we expect to change every every run. So, um, so in a way, it's the way the program works is that it just by default it would expect to always create a new restart manifest. Now, if you want to reproducibly run a previous uh, experiment, you would say, "I want to reproduce it," and it will insist that those restarts are the same. It won't try and make a new one. And that's basically all that a reproducible run is. Um, but that's quite quite a nice and easy way to say, oh, I want a reproducible run. Okay, I'm not going to make a new restart manifest. You, it has to match what you had before. Um, and so the inputs, for example, you don't expect to necessarily change that often, but if they do change, you might, you, you know, you can have flags 
this hasn't been um, coded up yet, but the idea is you can have a flag that says, look, I really want to make sure that my inputs never change. And if they do change, I don't want my run to go. I want to make sure I want to go and check. All right. So you can have a sort of a, um, a paranoid mode or whatever, or a very careful mode that says, no, I always want to make sure that nothing changes unless I know for sure. But but by default, what it would tend to do is just change the the um, the entry for each for everything that changes in the in the inputs, and maybe just give you a warning saying, uh, you know, this has changed. Maybe you can, maybe you don't. But the point is, it doesn't sort of matter whether it whether it tells you or not. All that information is stored in the Git repository that the, that your configurations are stored in. So all these files, these three files, all, are also added automatically to your Git. Um, your Git repo. So, uh, how is it tracked? Well, we use uh, Yar Manifest, which is just it's a, so it's a manifest um, library that I've written to use YAML files, which called Yar Manifest, um, and I just wrote it as a separate library because I want to use it for some other stuff as well. Um, otherwise, it just would have been part of Payu. Anyway, creates a YAML file, which is like your config.yaml, so same syntax, um, and each file, um, each each symbolic link in your work directory is a key in a YAML dictionary. So I'll show that. I'll tell you what that means. But um, so here's an example. Uh, just note that the first three lines, first two lines are a header, and then YAML works like this. You can you basically got two YAML files in two YAML. Documents. documents, thank you, in one file. So the first document is just uh, a format string and a version. Um, you don't have to care about that, but it just makes it easier for YAR manifest to know that it actually is a YAR manifest file and also means that we could change versions if we needed to change any specifications about how it how it's written and that would allow us some more flexibility. Anyway, so the only thing you have to worry about is after the three green dash lines. They're not green in the file, it's just syntax highlighting. So you see the first line there is is a path to your work directory. In this case, uh, this is an executable. This is the, the executable manifest. So it just has one, in this case it's one model, just has one executable. And so this that is a symbolic link. Everything, everything in your work directory ideally is a symbolic link except for configuration files which are tracked by Git. So your um, your input.nml and that sort of thing for mom models, all those nameless files that exist in your con control directory are copied into your work directory for the model to run. All your inputs, restarts, and this is this will this will involve a change to pay you. Your executables will be symlinked into your work directory. So the way this will I so said this this actually this changes the way PayU works a little bit. Um, so, for when this come, become, comes live and you can use this, um, your executables will actually be symlinked into your work directory as well. Uh, they'll look like that. Um, it'll be a file. Uh, actually, should we not just have the path to where it was called from? Well, you, so currently, what we do is just use the path in the MPI run. This has some. This has advantages, I think. I've talked to you about you know this what, before. Let's do it presented as you. Yeah. Well, so the advantage Sorry. of this is that you do a pay you setup, and then you look in your work directory, and you can see what what your executables are. What's going to run my model? Previously, you wouldn't know that until you ran it. Um, I think that's an improvement, uh, and allows people to inspect the state of the model more easily. But we'll see. Maybe it'll change. I'm pretty sure that this will have to be this way. I think. I mean, I will say the reason. Symlinks are used in many models is because most models don't really have the capacity to look outside of the directory of the executable. However, the executable does not need to be in the directory to run. No, that's a Linux thing. So, yeah, but what symlinks this... are a currently a necessity, not a convenient. You know, they're not done to provide information. So you're talking about using symlinks for a new new purpose. Partially new purpose. Yeah, I mean. It also fulfills the information model of how these manifests work in that everything that's a symlink in there pretty much is in the manifest. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, we can discuss the implementation. Okay. That's the idea. This is just an example. So um, each of those is a key. So if there are multiple files, there will be multiple keys. Uh, and, and for each key, there is a, a full path 
and there are hashes. So the full path is uh, just the path to the file, the path, the full path to where that exists on the on the file system. So as I said, normally mom would go and make symbolic links to all of your inputs and your restarts, and this is where they actually are on the file system. Um, so this is useful for, say, for tracking files. It's useful for um, for restarting from an existing configuration because everything that the model uses is in the manifests. Everything that the executables, the inputs and the restarts are all contained in the manifest and they have this full path to them. So it sort of doesn't matter where you run it, it should know where everything is as long as it can access it. Are the configs in the manifest? Say the name lists and stuff? The name lists are in your, so, no, no they're, they're, they're part of the Git repo. Right? So, so, so the state of the model has been distributed across two places at the moment. Yes. Right? Okay, all right. Just We've check. had this conversation before. Have we? Yeah. Okay, go on. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. So but this is just, just the idea is that you've got a full path uh, and it, it tells you where that, where that, is, where that resides in your, in your uh, directory tree. And, uh, and it has these hashes. Now, you shouldn't really look at these files ever unless you really care about it. It'll just take care of itself. I'm just telling you how it works. So it has hashes and then you can see underneath that it's got a, it's got a, two hashes, in this case a bin hash and an md5 sum. So what this allows for is multiple hashes uh, to be used. So why do you want to do that? You want to, so this allows for this hierarchy of hashes. So um, the reason you want to do that is because md5 and SHA-128, SHA-256, all these different uh, um, checksums uh, take too long to run on large files if you want, if they do it every time you do a PyU run. Yeah, you'd be waiting a few minutes or whatever every time, maybe longer. Um, it's it doesn't scale, and then if we get even bigger files, and if we go to you know one twentieth resolution or one fortieth, it's just not going to scale. So what we do here is um, use a fast hash for check to check for file changes, and then use a unique hash check when you, when it's necessary or perhaps periodically, um, just to make sure that everything's. Or you can just ask for it. You can just, uh, you know, you can you be able to do a PyU, you know, ha uh, manifest check or something, right? And, and check full or check, you know, you, you can you can satisfy yourself that they're fine. So what what's a what's the fast hash going to be doing? Well, um, in this case, there's this thing called bin hash. That's just something that I've written. Doesn't mean you can write any sort of one. This is a sort of a naive hand. It, what it's doing is grabbing the first hundred megabytes of the file. And it's hashing it together with the uh, with the modification time and the size, and so what this is doing is saying, well, I'm going to hopefully detect any change to that file. It's very unlikely that that file will have been that would be would have been changed without changing both the modification time, or the size, or the hash of the first hundred megabytes. But you never know. So that what that does is give you a a size independent hash time. So it doesn't matter how big the file is, your bin hash will take the same amount of time pretty much. Um, if it's smaller, it'll be a bit faster. I've also spent a fair bit of time uh, making multiple threads and stuff so that this will run fairly quickly. I was testing it on the quarter degree stuff and really it's just a few seconds uh, to do these fast hashes. So what would happen is, so this bin hash thing actually might detect changes that aren't real changes. In fact, you could you could just change the modification time of the file and it will go, oh, it's changed. That's, that's cool. It'll just go and check the, the full hash in that case. Um, this is why it's a hierarchy of hashes. And if it's the full hash is the same, it'll just update the bin hash. Um, uh, so it's a sort of, really the, the fast hash is just, just designed to find, just to detect it very quickly if there's been any changes. Now, in order for it to be defeated, um, it would, in order for it not to work, you, it would be very bizarre, and really, you'd have to go out of your way, I think, to to make an example of it where it wouldn't work. So I'm fairly confident that it, that it'll, that'll be okay. Um, uh, what am I? What's the time? Sorry, I don't have a, you Can I ask a couple questions about this, just because I yeah, think sure. it's awesome? So I'm just trying to like, yeah. What am I trying to say? I guess I don't fully understand when a hash of a file changes, and like, what if how does it work? Say I want to change an input file. What 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 happens if I want to change an input file and do I have to do something different? Just change it. And then all it what will do? All it will do is um, 
uh, it, um, so all it will do is um, update the hash in the in the file. Unless, as I say, unless you um, unless you want to um, specify some. Um, so it's not gonna like it's gonna find the hash. Says, if if the hash has changed, it just updates it. It doesn't like stop the run or anything no, no. stupid like that. No. Sorry. No. So so it doesn't tell you if the file if you're changing the model or anything like that. It's just saying, it's just keeping track of your changes. That's right. So okay. I'll just make this a bit bigger. So this is um, this, so this is it running on a mom sys model. Um, right. So you can so you can see if I look at MF. Uh, input. Uh, it's yeah. same thing. Bunch of things that you that look familiar, um, full paths and all that sort of stuff, right? So, um, as an example, so, if is I, that going to get copied to out each output directory essentially, so you could no, look through the history? No, it's, part of your, it's part of your Git repo. Oh God. Okay. I mean, we could copy it to output if you wanted to. Um, I suppose. I think it should be an output. Okay, Marshall says it should be an output. We'll put it on output. I think it should be, yeah, because then you can point. go through you and just do this snapshot of what okay. is used to produce these results. Okay. And we're not going to. Yeah, save that's the what I think too. All right, but I'm going to I'm going to put them in the Git repo as well. Things, but that's um, fine. But that's okay. But I mean, con yeah. config YAML is saved to the output, right? So so these YAML sure. files should yep. be because yes, I, I would actually. You know, I don't want to derail this too much, but I think we do need to do more to consolidate the state of the run as a whole, not just the input files. And sure, it, yeah, we should figure out a place to archive that with the run. Yeah. So um, if I just go paste. Um, so you want to make it part of the config run log repository or a separate repository? Config run log. Okay, so that's why you wouldn't track the config files because they're already part of that repository. Yes. So you're adding a file yes. like input.nml to the repository. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, in, it's enhancing the repo to effectively be enable tracking. Your so would that file? Thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean sorry. <laughs> I was trying to finish yeah. my thought. Yeah. Sorry. Would that file sit in your control directory? <clears throat> yes. So you, when you run it, you will have three new files in your control. Yes, directory. like this one. All right. Like this. I see. Input. So mf underscore xc dot yaml, mf in underscore input dot yaml, and mf underscore restart dot yaml. All right. So um, and you're you you're, you're flexible on this. We can maybe move those around and rename them. And yeah, I mean, in fact, settled on all this. You can change the name of them in your config dot yaml if you want. But would merging them be unrealistic? I um, you, talk, you know what? I'm sorry. Merging them? Finish up? No, they they have different different reasons for existing. Right. right. So. I, I would be resistant to that. So, so for example, if you want to look at this mf underscore xe one, um, this has got the executable. You see the full path to it. Now, if I touch that file, so that's changing the um, the modification time of the file, right? So, if I do pi u setup now, it will go through. Yeah, it's it's loading the input. Still getting that warning. You know, but anyway, so it's doing a bunch of manifest checks. You see, it's done it all for that one. Yeah. Okay. And um, now, if I do git diff, uh, you can see. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's right. So if I could git diff on the mfxe, it's updated the bin hash because the bin hash tag has a modification time in it. But you see, it it hasn't updated the md5 hash. It hasn't needed to because they're the same. Did um, it check that? Yeah, it, it checked it. Oh, it did? Okay. Yeah, it, the first thing it does is in the hierarchy of hashes, if it doesn't work, it goes and checks I the see. next one in I the see. hierarchy. And so you can choose what that, you can have multiple hashes. MD5 sum is known to have collisions. It's not a problem for this sort of stuff, I don't think. But if you got really crazy, and also if you wanted new hashes, there are some fast hashing algorithms that maybe we don't even need bin hash anymore, but we'll see. Yeah, actually, I have looked at it. So. So what? So you see, that's updated the bin hash. Now, what else has changed? Well, if we do a git status minus that minus s, you see that the restart has changed. And that's remember I said that that will change every time because it has to. Restarts always change every time unless you say I want to reproduce a run. And so um, if we so if we look at restart.yaml, you see it's 
you can see it's done what you'd expect it to do. Um, it's changed the, the restarts are now pointing at a different restart directory, which is what MOM does. Right? Um, so when you did the setup, it's actually uh, created all the manifest files for you already. Um, so if you if you swept that work directory into the pay you run, well, it wouldn't matter. It, it just wouldn't update the, the manifest. But there's a lot of things you can do, a lot of this file checking and manifest creation and stuff you can do without running it, just with a setup or there'll be some other command line arguments we'll, we'll add to do that sort of stuff. Yeah? So, um, and so you should be able to go and remove all the manifests um, and then pay you sweet and pay you run. Ah, so, and um, it may take a little bit longer, but um, it'll recreate them all again, no problem. And in fact, if those haven't changed from the last time, uh, says, oof, get, there it is, my says. Oh, they have, so there must have been some changes. But if they hadn't changed, if nothing had changed, and as long as it's in the same order, uh, it wouldn't even necessarily register it as a difference. Um, I'm not sure why they're all different. But anyway, whatever. Um, yeah, so that's that one. The other one I was just going to show whoop, was, so um, this is this, uh, this 1080. This, Can I ask a further uh, dumb question? Yep. So if the restarts aren't collated, you're going to have like 1,500 file hashes in there or whatever? Um, if the so what it's doing is it's doing file hashes when it's doing a new run. So if you don't restart your, yes, it's another good reason to collect, not collated. I mean, no, as long as you've got a decent IO layout, you should only have, you know, a couple of hundred. Um, All right. So... Uh, yeah, but it's a good reason not to have, yes. It, a couple hundred times 20. Restarts. Well, I tested it, um, okay. and it, right. it's okay. That's what I tested it for, because, um, but yeah, you can't, you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, it will just, it will go slowly for, if you've got thousands of files, it'll take longer, for sure. Um, yeah. That's just something you have to look at. But this, so this was just an example I just wanted to show you of the... Um, Could the we MP do the MP hashes in parallel to the model run itself? Yeah, separate we'll, thread. yeah, we can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so MPP and this is an, this is MPP and C combined fast. Um, so I had this new quarter degree layout that I was telling you about that has uh, integer tiling and all the rest of it. And so this was an example of collating, um, just collating some outputs. It doesn't have a bunch of outputs, but this is an unlogin node, uh, and it took twenty six seconds. Um, and used, well, used less memory than login node memory. I don't know. You can look it up. It's there somewhere. So, resident set, sorry. yeah, so we could do the same thing um, for the restart directory, for example. Um, and you'll see that's doing a bunch of restarts. It might die. I don't know how much memory this is going to take. Um, so, that I think that probably would take a minute and a half or something. Um, but you can do it on a login node. It, it's nuts uh, compared to what it used to be. Um, so that's good. Uh, I don't think I've so got time. Aiden, Aiden, about this fast thing, are we sort of implementing that by default now or have we each got to do something to adopt it or do you want to do more testing before we adopt it? Um, uh, I, I could be mean and say if you'd been at the beginning of the talk, you would have seen what was required. Um, but you won't be. I won't be mean. <laughs> no, no, don't so, yeah, so it's covered True in the talk. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the YouTube link. No, um, yeah, it's 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 in it's in MP, it's in the latest version of uh, PayU and is is currently usable by anyone. Uh, and I, I outlined it, but I can send you the details. Uh, so what's cool. the time? It's in, Oh, isn't it? Yeah, but you started 10 minutes late. Did I? <laughs> well, um, I was just going to go through just a quick, uh, I was going to go access OM2, maybe we should just do this another time, I don't know. Um, okay, we all know what's in no access OM2, we all know where the source code is, we all know this is JRA55, all you guys know, right? Um, you got three resolutions, one degree, quarter degree, tenth of a degree, 
and uh, running it on um, on Raygen is as simple as this, he says. So this is a one degree configuration. If I go, still doing collating wow, there. Slow. Oh, come on. <laughs> Where am I? So, um, I don't want to do that, do I? Yeah, I do. So I just made a directory. You can put your control directory anywhere. Um, I'm cloning it. I'm not going to run it. I'm just going to change one thing because I need to run it somewhere. I'm going to need to tell it. Well, two things, actually. Uh, laboratory. I'm just going to tell it that I'm going to run it here so that it doesn't pick up any of my other files, and I'm just going to tell it that I want to run an express. It's going to look there for your inputs and everything. That's what you want. It's not. Well, it's not, right? Because if I go pi you, oh, well, if I go pi you setup, this is this is, um, it's all there. So it tells me that I'm using the old collate style. This is the manifest. No, this is no, this is, this is the way the configs are set up. They've got full paths to all the inputs and executables. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, okay. And to the MPP and C combine executable as well. Okay. Um, so. Um, so I did a pay you setup. If I do a tree on the work directory, you can see it's all it's all there. So I can do pay you run, and it'll run. So um, I'll just go back. So those four commands, and you're running a one degree access OM2 model. Cool, huh? That's not me. That's um, Nick and Andrew uh, and. Steve. Nick, uh, it's, um, uh, setting them up so that they're sort of independent of where you're running. Now, the yes, the um, the manifest stuff will do a lot of this thing for you as well, uh, but it's a slightly different anyway. But you, so they've got a lot of a lot of the uh, position independence, if you like, by putting all those um, all those in hard coded in the config.yaml. So if you look, um, this is the config.yaml for that run. And uh, yeah, it's got PBS stuff, but that, that the magic is in here where it where it sets the input directories um, as full paths on. And uh, Nick is updating these paths, so the input and the executables he updates them sort of regularly. Um, so that does mean that if you yeah, well anyway, if you've got file tracking on, then you can know which one you used. Um, I guess you know that already because it's in the config at YAML, right? Anyway. Um, uh, I doubt that that started. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's Callum running bazillions of jobs. Um, Express there. Where am I? Oh, so I'm going to anyway. To answer Dimar's question. Yeah. <laughs> this is why it takes so long in the queue. Have I started? Yeah. Um, on one okay, so collating all those quarter degree restarts, that took um, about six minutes. Um, and uh, okay, restart, so it's 4.2 gig. Um, it actually is faster with bigger files, so it won't necessarily be sm slower. Like, it's just there's lots and lots of files to do, so it just takes a bit longer. But. Still, that's on a that's on a login node, and it took six minutes or whatever. So, hooray! Uh, and that's um, yeah, that's good. Um, and I think uh, unless this has started, then I think we'll call that quits. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Yeah, it started. Is that good? Yeah. Anyway, so has anyone have any questions? Very nice work, Aiden. Very nice work. work. Only I could get my multiple screens to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think um, those are the really hard problems. <laughs> manifest stuff should be incorporated. Yeah, there are problems. There are problems with updating all the individual drivers for the manifest stuff, um, particularly the access ones, um, and making them play nicely. 
Anyway, why isn't that doing anything? I don't know. Oh, uh, it's probably just hang or something. No, it's probably um startup. There, if you want. I'm sure you guys have told me this, but are these talks put up somewhere? Yeah, like, they'll be on. They'll be on YouTube. I'll sit, I yeah, like last last week's Marshall, you had some stuff on Pi, you GitHub set up that I was wanted to test, and I can't remember how to it's do it. Or... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all on YouTube. Email you the talk. The talk yeah, just email work. me the talk. Yeah. 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 Send it to me too. Actually. <laughs> Send it to everybody. All right. Oh, no, I saw that. It was, it was the week before last. Okay. Anyway, so there you go. Um, I think that's running. Yeah, there you go. Stupid Red Sea Golf Bay mix. Um, uh, so there you go, four lines and you're running a one degree model, which is pretty nifty. Okay. <coughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, Aiden. Thanks, Sorry, Aiden. <laughs> you're cool. All right. Uh, see you later then.